Renata, Andre, I really want to talk about multiple universes and string theory, but before we do, I have to ask you something. My wife is a pianist, and so I can talk science and finance, and she can ask me very wondrous questions because she doesn't understand that. And when she talks music, I can ask her, and she's the expert. But you guys are both physicists, so how does that work out? <laughs> so, um, until 98, indeed, we were completely uh, different. We were working in two different fields. I was working in string theory, and Andre was working in cosmology, and we bo both respected each other very much because we never understood each other. <laughs> then the crucial thing happened in 98. First, it was an observation of supernova, which showed that the universes, yeah, our universe, sorry, is uh, accelerating. It's expansion, Sol Perlman as well. Yes. Yeah. And secondly, we both were in Sweden, and I was in Göteborg at a string theory workshop, and Andre was in Stockholm on cosmology workshop. Mm -hmm. And so I joined him because his workshop was a few days later, uh -huh. and I came as his spouse, and mm -hmm. I never went into any uh, session there, mm -hmm. but I met my old friend Martin Rees. Uh -huh. yeah. In fact, uh, this summer in London, I was told you should not call him uh, Sir Martin anymore, you should call him <laughs> Lord Rees. <laughs> anyway, at that time, in 98, I asked him, uh, uh, Martin, should I worry about these strange rumors that we seem to have something like a positive cosmological constant? And at that time, he told me, no, don't worry yet, <laughs> but keep an eye. <laughs> Which was the time when I started asking uh, what is happening with cosmos, and they start teaching me. <laughs> And then it became clear by after 2000 that this is not going away, mm -hmm. that it is on the country much stronger with more data and that fundamental physics has to address it. And yeah. then this is how it started. Oh, so, so you're working together. We can lay at the feet of the, ex the accelerating expansion of the universe. Yes. That's, that's a fundamental contribution that that has made to, uh, to human endeavor. That's terrific. So, Andre, did you learn string theory a little bit from Renata? Well, I think that she learned much more cosmology from me <laughs> than I have learned string theory from her. Because string theory requires a lot of mathematical preparation and knowledge. Huh. Uh, cosmology, it's so easy. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, let, let's, let's really try to understand the collaboration, which is really what you've done in your physics marriage, literally and, and, and figuratively, is ex actually extremely important because if we have these two dominant theories in the world, multi-universes in cosmology and string theory with all the different vacua in, in string theory, if both are real, they have to work together. So, how, how, Renata, how, how would that begin to happen? Uh, I agree with you. And so what actually was the status of this working together, it didn't. <laughs> uh, but under pressure of these uh, facts that the universe we observe uh, shows this acceleration, and there was this very strange feature that the cosmological constant, apart from being uh, non-zero, which people were hoping, is also an extremely small number. Uh, all of this was very unusual, and and also it was fascinating. So to explain first the scale of how small is the number and why usual concepts in physics are not helpful to explain it, I, I, I thought I'll explain what numbers we are talking about. So the cosmological constant, uh, if we compare it with the natural value of Planck mass to the power of four, uh, has a number in front of it, which is 10 to the minus 120. So and 120 to, to decimal points with it, all these zeros and then you, something. You're, exactly. So you take one and then you have 120 zeros right. and then you take one and divide on this huge number. Yeah. Then you have an, this extremely small number. And this never happened in physics. And to explain this number uh, remains a fantastic challenge. And this is where the idea of a landscape of string vacuum. Uh, landscape meaning many, many different Many, many. So how many? Uh, one of the reasonable counting is to say that it is at least 
10 to the 500. So a one with 500 zeros is the number yes, of different street theories. Yes, it's the number in which people back. agree that they give reasonable amount of walls around us. Because uh, in the actual construction in which we participated <coughs> with Shanit Kachuan and Daylind and um, uh, Sandeep Trivedi from Tata, uh, what you see, if you take a big toolbox from string theory and you combine lots of various things and you end up with at least one vacuum, but then you immediately see there are <laughs> 10 to the 500 of them by special technical reasons that uh, string theory has, in addition to time and the f three dimensions which we see, a uh, consistent version requires six extra dimensions. And those dimensions should be extremely small, kind of curled. But this, still, this six-dimensional space is very unusual. And so when I was explaining it at the multi, um, multiverse uh, conference, which was at Stanford, I was using a picture of a slice of a quintic, which is one of the famous Calabi-Yau spaces. And it is now on the book, uh, Universe uh, or Multiverse, yeah. because uh, it was my way to explain people the technical part of the story. If you look at this picture, you see lots of holes in this space. I have a very similar picture here on the computer. Yeah. So I was using analogous picture, which I was trying to explain because at this multiverse uh, symposium, which we had at Stanford, we had physicists as well as philosophers. And so the way to explain and to give a visualization of the technical mathematical stuff was to show that these extra dimensions, which should exist in the consistent strings here, are very sophisticated. They have all these holes and various surfaces, and there are technical words like uh, fluxes, all kinds of things sure. like magnetic fields, which in the usual space everybody has heard we have just magnetic, flag, magnetic fields, but here we have many kinds of them. And we can choose spaces with different number of holes and different cycles on which we can wrap so brains. So this gives this so gives the string theory all the complexity. The combinatorics combinatorial of possibilities. Yes. In the end, after we can construct at least one vacuum which looks like the universe which we see now, then we have plenty. Right. We have huge number of them. Andre, so then how does it work for the the all the different vacua of string theory? to map on to the different multi, uh, different universes in the multiverse and giving each one a different characteristic? Well, you know, the properties of elementary particle physics, uh, they depend on the way how this internal space looks. What kind of, as Renata mentioned, flux are here? What is the topology of this kalabi yau space or whatever other space which is inside this six-dimensional part or multi-dimensional part of our uh, universe? So this works as if it were, well, genetic code encoded. Of it. Mm. This was an analogy which was used by Lenny Saskin. You see genetic code of the person, you know where it is uh, in, encoded. So here, genetic code of the universe. Depending on the structure of this internal space, you have either one value of the cosmological constant, which is vacuum energy, or another value completely different. And you may have one value of the electron mass or another value of it, depending on all of this. Yeah. So di uh, in different parts of our universe, in one part, you may have this type of compactification. In another part, you may have another. And this also not going to stay forever, because if you have one kind of compactification in this part of the universe, it may change. It may just jump to another space with different compactification, and then you will have different vacuum energy and different parameters of particle physics. So what we see here is the complexity, and that allows the complexity of string theory to it to, to adjust itself to all these different possibilities. Uh, even more, uh, people were hoping to find one unique solution of yes. a problem, and this doesn't look likely now, yeah. uh, because the solution is obviously not unique. We have too many, or at least as many yeah. as we can uh, construct. Yeah. And so the way to ask the question now is not why, for example, the cosmological constant which we see is the way uh, it is, uh, it is rather, the, the theory allows all kind of cosmological constant. Yeah. And so the correct way of asking, 
why we live in a place which has chosen this particular cosmological constant which we observe, because there are so many, and theory allows them. Well, th this is what you're referring to as the so-called anthropic principle, and you both worked on this, and it's, it's very controversial and misappropriated by some people. Other people are very critical of it in your field, but the question everybody asks is, it seems like philosophy that it's impossible to verify. And, and th th there's no experimental evidence, there's no observation that can be brought to bear on this kind of analysis. Andre, what? Well, uh, I would uh, disagree with that, even though the way in which I would disagree with that by itself is uh, rather unusual. Uh, you know, we have some experimental facts. Uh, the fact is, we have electron and we know its mass. And we know that it, this mass is very unusually small. But we know that if this mass would be two times larger or two times smaller, we would be dead. Our life is correlated with this particular value of the electron mass. If you consider proton and neutron, and you change mass of the proton just a little bit, make it just a little bit heavier than a neutron, then not neutron will be unstable, but proton would be unstable. And this would change absolutely every element in our universe and would make our life impossible. If you would change this vacuum energy, which is a cosmological constant, you change it like make it a thousand times larger or make it negative. In either of these cases, life as we know it would be impossible. So then why is it so that we have all of these unexplained numbers and there is still a very strong correlation between them and uh, our life? So this correlation is the fact which we need to be explained. And this is experimental fact. And the only theory which, as of now, explains this experimental, I emphasize, yes. fact, is the multiverse theory. Because it allows you to try. You can live here, yeah. you can live here, you can live here. If you would have just one universe, it would be your responsibility to prove that only this mass is possible and only this vacuum energy is possible. But right now we have a possibility to explain the correlation between these masses and your life.